We're now starting part three of our aerobic gram-positive bacilli lecture. In this lecture, we're going to continue discussing the genera included in the gram-positive bacilli that are associated with causing disease in humans. So in our last part two lecture, we talked about listeria, and right now we are going to talk about erysipelothrix. The genus Erysipelothrix has one species that is commonly associated with causing human infection, and that is the species Ruseopathii. Erysipelothrix ruseopathii is a gram-positive, non-spore-forming bacillus. It is a very slender in shape and tends to be somewhat filamentous. It is pleomorphic, so it has many different shapes to it. It just tends not to be very uniform. It is facultative to microaerophilic, and if you remember, microaerophilic means the organism likes lower oxygen levels. It takes several days for this organism to grow and be visible on agar media. So commonly in the clinical laboratory, you are going to take your clinical specimen, you're going to streak for isolation onto whatever media that particular specimen gets streaked onto, usually blood agar and maybe a couple of different selective medias. You need to then incubate those medias overnight, check them the next day, and typically they'll go back into the incubator and they're checked again the next day. And if you were thinking erysipelothrix, you might want to even incubate for a third day. Erysipelothrix is alpha hemolytic on blood agar. If you remember, alpha hemolytic is the partial hemolytic where you'll see a greenish tinge in that blood agar. Erysipelothrix causes three different types of diseases. Endocarditis, and this is most common in individuals who have had heart valve replacements. It also causes erysipeloid, which is a very localized skin infection, and it resembles a streptococcal erysipelous infection. Erysipeloid has an incubation period of one to four days before you can see that cutaneous infection. It usually involves an infection of the skin on the fingers and the hands. So it's usually due to contact. So fingers and hands will commonly be affected. Le the skin lesions are usually erythematous. So they're usually red, have a raised edge, might be a little hot to the touch, and it will slowly spread out. It usually cures itself within three to four weeks. However, it tends to relapse. So you might get this skin um, infection, goes away in a couple of weeks, and then a couple of weeks later, it seems to come back. The third type of disease that erysipelous erysipelothrix causes is septicemia, which of course is the most severe um, disease, although this one is rare. So usually um, you will get an endocarditis that might develop after a septicemia. And here's a classic erysipeloid where you'll see it on the hands or the fingers. And you can see it's a nice little skin erythematous ulcerated lesion. Erysipelothrix is ubiquitous. It's distributed worldwide. It is primarily a zoonotic organism with pigs being the main reservoir. It's also been isolated from mammals, birds, fish, as well as the soil. So this is erysipelothrix in a pig. So it even causes cutaneous lesions in infected pigs. Transmission is most commonly through contact, trauma, or puncture to the skin. So erysipelothrix tends to be an occupational disease. So butchers that have to cut up um, pork products 
meat processors, farmers, especially pig farmers, poultry workers, fish handlers, as well as veterinarians, especially veterinarians that might go to farms and work on pigs, are much more highly at risk of erysipelothrix infection. In the laboratory, your erysipelothrix is a gram-positive filamentous rod. It doesn't grow very well. It takes the two to three days to grow on agar media, so commonly it's very difficult to isolate. It will be culture negative. So it will grow on conventional media, such as your 5% sheet blood agar plate, and it is best to be grown under microaerophilic conditions, so lower oxygen tension conditions. So it will it will grow within a couple few days in a CO2 incubator. It doesn't grow that well in an ambient air incubator. It might take even longer to grow if it grows at all. If you do grow it on sheep blood agar, you will see that it's alpha hemolytic. This is a non-modal organism. So that's key because if you remember, listeria is modal. It's catalase negative, and remember, listeria is catalase positive. It produces hydrogen sulfide. So if you remember in our first lecture, we talked about triple sugar iron agar. And with that agar, you can look at carbohydrate fermentation of glucose, lactose, and sucrose. You can also see gas production, and you can see hydrogen sulfide production. The agar turns black. So erysipelothrix will turn the um, triple sugar iron agar media black due to hydrogen sulfide production. It is Vogue's Proskauer negative. And if you do a gelatin stab culture, which is a, a gelatin um, media inside a test tube, it will produce a brush-like pattern if you incubate this organism at 22 degrees, which is very close to room temperature. You can treat this, disease, this organism with penicillin, cephalosporins, erythromycin, and clindamycin. We're going to move on now to lactobacillus. And luckily, lactobacillus is another one of these organisms where there's only one species that we um, need to worry about. And that species is acidophilus. So lactobacillus acidophilus is a facultative organism, so non-fussy, it's aerobic, of course it's gram-positive, it is highly pleomorphic. So this organism can be really long, like spaghetti, very thin, it can sometimes have squared ends, it can chain together and make these long rod chains, it can also have a very coxoid look about it, it can can kind of form these spiral type shapes, so it is very pleomorphic. It is a non spore former, it is non modal. Again, your listeria is modal, your erysipelothrix is not modal, your lactobacillus is not modal, and it has optimal growth at a pH of 6. Here's lact lactobacillus associated with a squamous epithelial cell. And you can see that there are some shorter rods there. There are some really long rods. There are some rods that are a little fatter than others. There are rods that are chained together. So that's classic lactobacillus. This organism is widely distributed in nature. It can also be found in foods. It is normal flora in the mouth, the gastrointestinal tract, and the female genital tract. And this organism commonly contaminates urine specimens. Just like if you remember, I'm always going to try to link you back to another lecture because it's very easy to get focused on one lecture and one group of organisms. But you, you have to try to force yourself to see the big picture. So if you remember, 
Staphylococcus epidermidis is another gram-positive organism, but it's a cocci, that is a common contaminant in urine specimens. Why? Well, Staphylococcus epidermidis is a norm normal flora of the skin. Lactobacillus is normal flora of the female genital tract. The genital tract in the female is very close to the urinary tract. So you have to be really careful, especially women, to do a clean catch urine specimen if you were to submit a urine for culture. If a clean catch urine is not done, that urine commonly can contain skin and genital contaminants. So lactobacillus is a common organism you could see in a urine culture in the clinical laboratory. When you guys are in the clinical lab, you will see this organism growing up in urines, as you will your staph um, epidermidis organisms. So lactobacillus is one of our major normal flora organisms. This organism is in our mouth, it's in the GI tract, it's in the genital tract. This is one of those organisms that we absolutely need. So if our lactobacillus gets depleted in our gastrointestinal tract, we can end up getting diarrhea. So this is not the type of organism that's causing diarrhea. What happens is if you're taking antibiotics and it starts to reduce the numbers of lactobacillus in our genital tract, it can allow for overgrowth of other organisms in the genital tract that can lead to diarrhea. So lactobacillus is one of these beneficial or you know, commensal organisms that lives inside our bodies and we really need it there. It is incredibly rare to find lactobacillus involved in any serious disease. Of course, any organism that gets into the bloodstream is, can cause a very serious disease. And absolutely any organism can get into the bloodstream if it has an opportunity. If it gets into the bloodstream, it can get into areas such as the heart and cause an endocarditis. For lactobacillus, this would be more commonly associated in a severely immunosuppressed individual. So lactobacillus, we need it in our bodies. It does protect our, we already said, our gastrointestinal tract. It al doesn't allow other organisms in the GI tract to overgrow. That's why sometimes if you're taking antibiotics or you're tummy's not feeling right, you're told to eat yogurt because yogurt contains lactobacillus in it and you want to replenish that normal flora in your intestinal tract. Also in females, it protects the um, female genital tract. Lactobacillus acidophilus produces lactic acid. That keeps the vaginal pH low, and by having a lower vaginal pH, that suppresses the overgrowth of other organisms that are common flora of the female genital tract, such as Gardnerella, Prevotella. So you want to not allow those other organisms to overgrow because those other organisms can lead to disease. These organisms are very, very tiny pinpoint colonies. So like the streptococcus that are also tiny, these organisms are very tiny as well. And they are alpha hemolytic. So they can be confused with some of the alpha hemolytic streps when they're grown on blood agar. They're commonly isolated from the vaginal and cervical tract specimens as normal flora and they commonly contaminate urine specimens. So normally, they're not the cause of a urinary tract infection. They're just a contaminant in the urine from not collecting a clean catch specimen. 
Lactobacillus is not commonly identified in the lab. The reason is it's usually not the cause of infection. It is more commonly a contaminant in certain types of specimens, such as a female genital specimen and a urine specimen from a female. But the organism is catalase negative and it has the morphology that we've discussed. You will see this organism in the clinical lab, but you will very rarely speciate it and do any biochemical tests on it because it is normal flora. In the rare case of infection by lactobacillus, you can treat with penicillin in combination with an aminoglycoside agent. Now we're going to move on to another gram-positive bacillus. Again, this genus, Gardnerella, has one species that is clinically relevant, and that is the species Vaginalis. Gardnerella vaginalis is a very small, pleomorphic organism that's gram-variable. So technically, it is a gram-positive organism. However, this organism tends to over decolorize very, very easily. So this organism can come look like a gram negative pleomorphic rod when you gram stain it in the laboratory. It tends to be very short, so very short rod cacobacilli. So it can be confused with a gram-positive coccus. It produces small gray colonies. It doesn't grow very well on commercial blood agar, so your 5% sheep blood agar, Gardnerella doesn't grow all that well on. It does grow on an agar called human blood bilayer tween, or HBT agar, and on that agar it will have a zone of beta hemolysis that diffuses out from the organism. This organism can be normal flora in the vaginal tract of females. The growth of this organism is suppressed by your lactobacillus acidophilus normal flora. It can also colonize the very end or distal urethra of males. So transmission is not known specifically, but it's thought that transmission of this organism is possibly endogenous, meaning an individual um, transmits the organism from their own normal flora. Gardnerella vaginalis, the most common infection that it causes is bacterial vaginosis. It can very rarely cause urinary tract infection and also rarely cause bacteremia. To diagnose this organism, you would take uh, a vaginal a clinical specimen, so vaginal secretion that's been put onto a slide, and do a gram stain of it. You can also do a wet mount of a vaginal secretion. What you would see are clue cells. Clue cells are these very large squamous epithelial cells. So they look like a big, huge fried egg under the microscope. What you would see with these clue cells is all these teeny, teeny, tiny rods or cacobacillus attached to it. So a bunch of gram-positive or gram-variable can have a gram-negative look about it. Teeny tiny rods attached to these large squamous epithelial cell cells. So a ton of small tiny rods attached to these large epithelial cells is indicative of a Gardnerella vaginalis infection that's causing bacterial vaginosis. What you want to see in a clinical vaginal specimen is a ton of lactobacillus, long, chaining, spaghetti-looking, gram-positive rods. So a ton of lactobacillus in a vaginal secretion is, is good, it's healthy, and it 
wouldn't be indicative of bacterial vaginalis, but the, a ton of Gardnerella vaginalis would be indicative of a potential infection. So here you have your clue cells, these large fried egg looking squamous epithelial cells with a lot of very teeny tiny cacobacilli and you know, small little short rods attached to the epithelial cells. When you see this, it, these are called clue cells and it's indicative of bacterial vaginosis. So we're going to move on to part four of our gram-positive bacilli lecture.